Am I forgetting anything? I think it covers all the bases. All right, starting to look. Uh, let's start with the witness this morning. Third chapter. <coughs> and say I'll ask you to read verses nine through fourteen, please. Leviticus twenty-three, verses nine through fourteen. Mm-hmm. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them. When ye be come unto the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. Uh, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf, and he land without blemish of the first year for the uh, burnt offering unto and the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths steel flour mingled with oil an offering made by far unto the Lord for a sweet savor and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine the fourth part of a hen and ye shall eat neither bread not parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. Father God, I thank you for this word this morning. I ask the words my mouth and meditation of my heart will be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Yes. May the church have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would share to this church this morning. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, Amen. Amen. The title of the message is "Forget New Year's Resolutions, Become a First Fruit Offering." <coughs> Forget New Year's Resolutions, Become a First Fruit Offering. We all know what resolu- New Year's resolutions are. These are these ideas that people seem to come up with on either New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, saying, "I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that," or "I'll give up this and I'll give up that." And the odds are, none of them ever go anywhere beyond that. They just don't happen. Because you're looking to change a behavior that you're comfortable with. And so you can say whatever you want, but it's when it gets into the heart and really into your spirit is when it makes a change. But I got something I believe is better for you. And God offers to you this morning a wonderful way to forget New Year's resolutions and all that and get in track with something that the church has forgotten all about. And it's called first fruit offering. Something be and let me say right before I start, this is not a sermon on tithing. So don't go there with me, because that's not what first fruits is about. First fruits offering goes back to the Torah. It goes back to Mount Sinai. When Moses was given a teaching by a father saying, When you enter into the promised land, you're going to do this offering. And it's going to fall on Passover, and seven weeks after Passover, it's going to fall again on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now before I get into all the details, what is a first fruit offering? It's where you take a sheaf, which is also called a stalk, and you put your harvest, your first fruits of what you do for a living, in it, and offer it to the Lord. And what they did is they would take an offering and put attach it to this stake or stalk, and they give it to the high priest, and he would literally wave it before the Lord as an offering to God. The purpose of the first fruit is exactly what it is, the first fruit of whatever you do for a living, in their case, obviously harvesting, they would take the first fruits, and they bring it to the Lord in gratitude, and recognizing to, that God is the provider of all harvest, And here's the part where the world separates and makes a vow to God to commit that year with a committed 
pure heart to God. That is not what the world teaches you, and I'll get to that in a little bit. I want to go over this again. It's where they take a sheaf, they call S-H-E-A-F, of the harvest. They attach to that harvest whatever the first fruits of what they do, and we'll say in this case to make it simple, barley or something of that nature. They give it to the high priest who uses it as a wave offering, which is a sign giving it to the Lord, asking it to be acceptable to him. And they in turn are saying to God, we recognize you are the Lord of the harvest, and you will be Lord of the harvest going forward, and we want to thank you. We want to thank you for what you've done. And they make a vow to literally dedicate themselves to live a committed life that year to God. Now, as I said, this started in the Old Testament. Obviously, in the wilderness, they could not plant crops. Number one, they were on the move. Number two, if you see Sinai you desert, forget it. You're not going to grow nothing out there. So what did God do? You know what God did. He provided a manna from heaven. He provided the water. And at one point, he provided a meat. The point is God provided the harvest. And that's where this was founded. The problem is, nobody thinks about that today. They have another word for it, and I'll go there in a little bit. But there's more to it than just this wave offering. There were two sacrifices offered. One was a burnt offering, and one was a grain offering. And the burnt offering is another name for a sin offering. And they would bring, and again, the priest would do this, as a sign, the burnt offering was for the atonement of the people, and a grain offering was a really a fellowship offering, and an offering of thanksgiving. Out of all this, was telling them and telling back to God, you are our first love. We recognize you are the Lord of our lives, and we don't want anyone else. There's a lot of significance into this offering. And I'll get into a couple of those in a minute. But I want to also say this is also covered in 1 Corinthians, which is the New Testament. So let's turn over to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to do a little jumping in Scripture here. But I want to, I'm, it's going to come to a very serious purpose in a few minutes. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Darlene if she would read, please, verses 20 through 23, just those two. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with the 20th verse. But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that sleep or slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. 22. 23. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Now, what does this have to do with first fruits? Well, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, Christ represents the first fruits from the dead. He's the first to be raised. But we're going to find ourselves also under the new law, the new covenant, that we are first fruits of the Spirit. And the key here is when they offered the first fruit offering in the Old Testament, they had to offer up offerings, and they included seven unblemished lambs, one bullock, and two rams. And we know the number seven is very important to God. And when we think of that, it reminds us that Jesus is, and was, and will always be, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, the unblemished Lamb. And the number seven gives us three points. Completion, fulfillment, and perfection. You want to go into the new year with something new? Let's go to God for completion, fulfillment, and perfection. With a, fulfill, with a first offering. First fruit offering. It related to the other festivals. It started at Passover. And Passover symbolizes... A receiver's deliverance from the world. It wasn't just remembering the Exodus. It also was on following that immediately was the festival of unleavened bread. And that symbolized an urgency 
for the believer to seek the promised land. Well, so are we. We're looking to our future reward in heaven. And then seven weeks after Passover came Pentecost. And that experienced total gratitude for the harvest. First fruits then ties into the feast of the church, of the, of the, of the Torah. And it gives us a glorious hope that through Christ as our first fruits, we have a destiny that nothing and no one can take away. And the first fruits was done, believe it or not, on a Sunday, the first Sunday of the Jewish New Year. And hello, we're in the first Sunday of our New Year. So why the big deal? So what? Well, it is a big deal. And we're going to put some scripture to show it. Turn over to Jeremiah 19. Excuse me, Jeremiah 29. I'm going to ask Mike if he would please read verses 1 through 7 when he's ready. 29, did you say? Yes, ma'am. 29, 1 through 7. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King... Uh, Jer yeah. Uh, as she said it. This is a good old boy. <laughs> and the queen mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elish, a son of Shepan, and to Gemera, son of Hilkiah who uh, Zedekiah, king of Judea, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you in, uh, to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't following. I was just listening. Yeah. What's that got to do with this? A lot. The exiles are going to be there for 70 years. They have nothing to hold on to. And they're hearing false prophecies go all around them. You're, don't worry, God's going to deliver you tomorrow. And it doesn't happen. And Jeremiah, the prophet of the day, one of the prophets today, Ezekiel being the other, says, settle down, get comfortable, just live your life as you would normally. But the key is, it says to sow and plant. And so if they do that, that means they're going to honor those feasts to the best they are able. And I guarantee you, first fruits was at the top of the list. Why? I just got done explaining this. Because it links directly to the resurrection and life. And in this case, God is promising them restoration. And out of first 
fruits, when we sow into a first fruits ministry, is restoration. How many people, and I, I bet everybody in this room would have to, at least I have to say this, I think you all would. Isn't there something in your life you wish you could take back and not have done? Well, you're not. You're very unique. <laughs> really unique. Well, i got a hotline for you. Remember the basic principle. When the enemy robs you, you take it back how many times? Seven. seven. And what did we just say about seven? Completion, fulfillment, and perfection. First Fruits is offering you restoration. And it'll make more sense as we go along. I want to keep going, though. Let's turn over to Romans 8, verses 22 and 23. No. Okay. Ruth, if you can get, pull that up when you're ready. Romans 8, 22 and 23. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Christ is the first fruits of the dead. The first to arise. The first to bring resurrection into the life of a believer. You, under the covenant promise between Father and Son, have the promise of eternal life when you confess Christ as your Lord. You are the first fruits of the Spirit. You are the first believers. Going back to Pentecost that received the releasing of the Holy Spirit on you. You walk in a spiritual state before Christ. It is your spirit that cries out for redemption. It is your spirit that cries out for fellowship. It is your spirit that cries out for intimacy with your God. The rest of you is flesh that's too busy doing all sorts of other things. Listen to your spirit and take the first fruit promises that are yours. Let's go to Romans 11, 16. Last one. <coughs> it's, um, for if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. First fruits is vital for your spiritual transformation into holiness. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to do a daily growth and transformation of you into the image of Christ. But if you don't offer the first fruits of yourself, you're never going to reach it. And this is the reason many, many new Christians fall by the wayside. Number one, they're not taught. Number two, they're given some kind of ice cream portion of, oh, everything's going to just be beautiful. No, it doesn't work that way. Your response to Christ's gift of eternal life is a life of gratitude and service. And guess what? That comes under first fruits. Because I just defined that for you. This offering is lost in the church. We use the word tithing. I got a hotline for you. That's not the story. The story goes in much deeper. Now, before I get into that and how we're going to do this, I want to tell you what happens if you don't do it. Turn over to Genesis 4. I don't know if you should read this one too. Genesis 4, 1 through 16. It's a very familiar story, but I think it drives home the point. Genesis 4, 1 through 16? Yeah. It says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his a brother Abel, and, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was, was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first persons of his flock 
and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why is thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou do not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, mm -hmm. the king rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto the king, Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now art thou curses from the earth, which hath opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A, a fugitive, a vagabond, shall thou be in the, in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be, uh, I be hid. And thou shalt be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall, say me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, Vincent shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him shall kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east. The key verse there is God talking to Cain and saying, If you don't bring me a pleasing offering, sin lies at the door. God's warning him. If you do not offer first fruits, which is your best fruits, not just some token, you're gonna you are basically saying that you are more important than God and your offerings more important than God, and sin is at the door, and in this case it resulted in the first murder of creation. In Luke thirteen, we're not gonna look there right now, is the story of the fig tree. Jesus goes to the fig tree. And there's nothing on it. He curses it. Well, he curses it. Next day, the fig trees dwindle up. It had nothing to do with eating. It had to do with Jesus coming to that fig tree. And the fig tree was not ready to receive him. It did not have fruit bearing. So he said, one year we're going to do this. They're going to, the tiller, they'll, de they'll do all this landscaping around it, sewing in all the whatever stuff it does to help it grow. And then we'll come back. That to me is a warning to the church. If you're not ready for God, your first fruits, he's coming back again. And this time you better be ready. Not worried? Let me, give it, let me deal straight. The church has taken this teaching and turned it into what we call prosperity preaching. I am sick and tired of these major evangelists going out there and telling you Sow a thousand dollars and tomorrow you'll reap a ten thousand dollars. There is nothing in first fruits that says that. Because it's not about sowing, it's not about reaping, it is trusting God for the reaping, and it's a sowing of gratitude and thanksgiving for what He's given you. You don't sow saying, if I put this in, maybe something will come out. This is not a one armed bandit where you put a quarter in and think about twenty quarters are going to come out. You understand what I'm saying? This prosperity thing has gone rampant throughout the church. It's ridiculous. Amen. We got one evangelist out of Florida. He's been preaching it for three years. And she not only loves teaching it, she brings in specialists who come in, and they teach it every doggone day. One of the greatest persons we ever served under in this church is also into this kit, which totally threw me back. Unfortunately, he's gotten off of that into something better. But the point is, it's, it's being shared. So, and what do they do? It They do it for fundraising. Well, if you want to fundraise, you fundraise. But do not tell your brother or sister this lie that if you sow, you're going to reap big time. You will reap. But it is the heart that God looks at, not the dollar. It is the motive of the heart that is the key. Understand? Because you're going to hear all this junk all the time. It's not going down, it's getting worse. Ministers are hurting out there. Well, I'm not going to go into all that stuff. 
but it does not justify taking a teaching that I might add, and I quote from Scripture, is a statute. That means it is a perpetual thing to be done always. Well, everybody thinks that ever since Jesus came, everything in the Old Testament went out the door. You guys know better than that. It is something that every New Year we should be looking at doing. As a group and as individuals. And it's not built on prosperity giving or receiving. So why is this important? Well, I told you it's important. It's important because it's the statue of God. It's like the commandment to have communion, to do water baptism. It's a command of God. We don't do it. Why do we remember the feast here? Because it's a command of God. Why do we celebrate Passover here? It's a command of God. We don't pick and choose. We do what the Lord says. New Year's is a time to sow. And money's part of that. But it's not the purpose of it. And you will reap what you sow. But it's not about the money. It's about the spirit. And it's about you and your personal relationship. Is God your first love? And that's where it hits the metal hits the road. If he is, first fruits should be something you look forward to. Not something that you debate about or fear that, oh God, you're going to ask me for money. In selling for first fruits, it sets in motion for this year, 2014, the very promise that you ask of God, Lord, order my steps. I was counseling somebody the other day who was in the process of looking for a job, and I said, the best thing you can do is give it to the Lord and ask him to order your steps. Go hope, continue as you are, but ask the Holy Spirit to direct you what you're to do, and let God order your steps. That way you'll be in the perfect will and you'll have the best job you could ever want in your life. I promise you. It sets in motion God's plans for your life. Things that may have been held back. And you say, why am I still waiting for such and such? I heard this shared the other night. And I think it was Darlene who shared it last Sunday. If you're in the same place where you were a year ago, something's wrong. And it isn't God. Sorry. Can't blame him. And don't look at me. I didn't do it to you. I got my own problems to worry with. The problem is, if you're in the same exact place you were last year, something is wrong in God's plan because God moves forward. He doesn't sit still and do nothing. So think about it. Turn. This is the last scripture for the day. Turn over to Revelation 14. Tell me first for its end part of it. Look at Revelation. Revelation 14, 1 through 5, I have. Hey, um, Mike, if you have a good read when you're ready. 5? Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on, the, on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, like the sound, or like the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths, and they are blameless. Want to be a first fruit for God? You can be. You want to be set apart for God? It can be. You want your life to take on new meaning? It can be. You want God to really be your first love and not just tell it because it sounds good? It can be. New Year's resolutions. Empty promises of nothing. This is what I'm going to suggest you think about. When you sow your offering today, I don't care if it's one penny or whatever it is. It's not about the money. 
But I want you to sow differently in your spirit with God. And this is between you and the Lord. I cannot, I will not ask you to say anything. I'm going to say it's your call. Remember the definition. It's thanking God for what he's given you and, and this is where it gets lost, and a commitment, a committed life to serve him. It's a new year. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but he's waiting on you to move you. Maybe it's a new ministry. Maybe you need to find time to get in his word and you never do. Maybe you need to develop a prayer life and you can't, you know, you're too embarrassed for whatever reason, tell us. Maybe you're looking for a new way to serve him and you don't know which way to go. Maybe it's time to get out of the comfort zone and let 2014 be a new year. Maybe it's time to leave the old ways and say, God, I'm going to serve you in a new way and I'm going to start with this because I really want you to be my first love and not just say it. Remember the church of Ephesus. They did all these things, but they had left the first love. That's the key of everything. Maybe it's time to start using those gifts that we've repeatedly said to you, you got them, you're just not using them. Maybe it's time to use them. Maybe it's time to stop worrying about the tithe and add to a time and treasury. You've been taught this before. Maybe it's time just to let God take over 2014 and direct your paths. Maybe it's time to just literally do something for those in need. Visiting the nursing homes. Going to the orphans. Maybe it's time just to sow into a new ministry out there. First Fruits is an opportunity to set in motion God's plan for you. And all you've got to do is say, here am I, send me. And mean it. So when you give your offering today, I don't care about the money. I really don't. I just don't care. A lot of pastors would faint if they heard me say that. No, I don't. I just don't care. Because God takes care of these things. What I do care, though, is your spiritual walk and mine. I'm concerned because I think this year is going to be an incredible, challenging year. Last night, John and Jordan and I had the literal you-know-what scared out of us about 10 o'clock. I mean, it, it, it floored me. We heard explosions, and we still don't know exactly where it came from, but it was definitely not close, but it was loud enough we heard them. And they didn't sound like no fireworks to me. And John went out to check them out, and he came back and he said, this doesn't sound like fireworks. I said, what it does sound like is the very thing I don't want to say. It sounded like bombs. Explosions. And we knew we weren't hearing things, so the dog was trembling like he always does when something like that happens. He was trembling. And the way they sounded just did not follow the pattern of any fireworks I've ever heard. So I called Harry County Police. I said, I don't know what's going on. There's nothing on the news. I want to know the truth. Are we under attack? Is something going on here? And I got a meeting answer. Oh, that's a fireworks display down the road. Oh, I'm glad somebody knows about it. But since when did they start a fireworks display at 10.30 at night? Something's going on. First fruits for us is trusting the Lord. First and last. So when we got kind of wound down from all that, and I woke up this morning and I'm still thinking about it. Because I don't know what's going on out there. But I do know this. I know that this year is going to be a challenging year. More than we've faced. I wish I could give you good news about the economy. I don't care what you're hearing. The economy is not stable. If you think it is, I'm sorry. It's not. Banks are having a lot of problems. I can go through finance some other time with you. We know about our leadership. I don't need to go there. We need God on the throne. We need God in the running country. We need to get back to God. First fruits is your time to change things. There was a movie, and John, help me out, is it Evan Almighty or Everett Almighty? What is that thing? Evan it, Almighty. Evan Almighty? I don't know if you ever saw the guy has to build us a, a art yeah. for oh, God. Yeah, that's Evan Almighty. Almighty. It's a great movie. What I remember out of that movie is not, uh, well, a lot of things, but the main thing is what I was writing, it, I was thinking about, the star that said, how do I change the world? That was this whole political move. I want to change the world, and God answered him, said, one kind deed at a time. Just one thing. I want you to pray about that today on your offering. Your first fruits is not just for you, it's for those around you. 
Remember, when you stand before the Lord, I guarantee you, you're going to have people coming up to you thanking you for something you did, and you'll say, who the heck are you? It doesn't matter. You touch their lives in some way. I have a whole bag load of people I'm probably looking for saying thank you that I probably will never see until eternity. It's time to take out your sheaf, put your first fruits, time, talent, treasury, give it to the priest, wave it before him, and thank God for what he's given you, thank God what he's going to do for you, and thank God for what you're going to do for him in 2014. And just maybe, just maybe, it'll go like a pattern that will change and restore this country. Who knows? It only takes one prayer. Just say it's Daniel. Because a Daniel, an entire nation was set free by one prayer saying, God, you said. And I'm quoting God his word all the time saying, God, you promised this. You said this. And after all the years I've known the Lord since age 14, I've yet to hear him say no to any of those. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's it for me. Let's sing something. <laughs>